Young people, yours is the generation we older people have been waiting for. We've let the world slip away from us. We've been waiting for you to come along and begin to solve the problems that we've created. We've created an environmentalist mess. We've maintained racism and sexism and militarism. We have, in fact, screwed up this planet big time. It's up to you, you young people, to rise to the occasion and become red letter Christians. I mean, if you go to the Bible and look at the red letters, you'll see the words of Jesus. When we start taking them seriously, when we take Jesus seriously and live out his radical commands, the world will change. The world's been waiting for young people who will do just that. Will you become one of them? Stay with us. We're going to talk about that. Hi, I'm Shane Claiborne with Tony Campolo. Welcome to Red Letter Christianity. We're asking the question of what would the world look like if we took the words and teaching of Jesus seriously today? And we've got an exciting guest today, Jim Cummings, a friend of yours who I don't know too well. Tell me, tell us about Jim. Well, uh, Jim is, uh, you know, this, this program is supposed to be for young people. Uh, Jim at 53 decided to leave the business world and come to work with a bunch of young people in Camden, New Jersey. Many people call it the worst city in America, and for just reason. 94% of the kids born in Camden last year were born out of wedlock. If you're between 15 and 25, uh, there's a 42% chance you'll spend at least one year in jail. Uh, it's a horrible place to be. Uh, one out of every nine houses is deserted. Uh, 10,000 people drive into this city of 80,000 to buy drugs every day. So he, he leaves the business world, comes to Camden, and starts this thing called Urban Trekkers. Hmm. And he's got these inner city kids, uh, tough kids, mostly African-American and Hispanic kids. I don't know whether any Caucasian whites are even in the group, but he, he puts them together and takes them out into the mountains, takes them into, into the wilderness, and uh, there they're supposed to somehow meet Jesus. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to yeah. see what he's got to say about all of this. Yeah. Well, I, I know uh, in, in our neighborhood in North Philly, we, we've got a community in Camden, too. There's not a whole lot of difference. But yeah. you, you take kids in the city, and they go out in the country, and they're all scared of the boogeyman, or they hear the crickets, and they're like, what's that? You know, and you take kids from the suburbs in the city, and they're scared people are going to shoot them or stab them. But I, I, think, I think there's, there's something to getting outside of our element yeah. and expanding our world that's, that's healing. I, I remember taking a, a bunch of inner city kids from, from Philly. Uh, to uh, this Mennonite camp out in the countryside. We thought this would be great. And they were there for the weekend, and uh, they were scared to death. They, they heard crickets. What's that, man? What's that? What, what's that sound? Is that somebody coming to get me? They have frogs scared them to death. I mean, all the sounds were so different, and they were so unused to it. But I remember we got on the bus on Sunday night and driving back uh, to Philadelphia. And we drive into this slum, and this kid wakes up and looks around, and he says, Oh, Philly, how wonderful to be back in Philly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it was a matter of a totally different environment that really scared the kid. Mm. So it'll be interesting to see what he's got to say about going into a new environment. Yeah. You know, they do some other weird things. I, I, I read in the newspaper, they make the newspapers a lot uh, in Philadelphia and in Camden, mm. New Jersey, uh, because they got these kids doing this strange stuff. Like they got kids building rowboats i mean from scratch hmm. taking lumber and making a rowboat and then taking it out on the river hey I mean, jesus jesus was a carpenter yeah you know? they, there yeah. he is he was a carpenter number one and he he did like fishing yeah like yeah. fishing like like getting out in boats well it, it, part of i think the disconnect that we have is like kids grow up in a concrete world and they, they there's there's beautiful things about that i mean we're having block parties right now where kids are playing in the fire hydrant but there's also something to like seeing creation and uh one of the kids in our neighborhood said um, it's easier to get a gun than a salad in our neighborhood and, and, you, and you think boy kids need to see the world they need to get to see water and mountains and trees and, and so i'm excited to hear about what jim's doing when i go to the bible when i read like the 148th psalm where the psalmist is calling upon the trees to sing praises to god the the whales to sing hymns to god uh, the birds to sing to God. Uh, you the, sound like a hippie. Yeah. Uh, and St. Francis of Assisi <laughs> is right, into yeah. that. 
uh, where uh, uh, he calls upon all the creatures of nature to sing praises to God. Mm. And you know, city kids don't ever get to hear those sounds. Mm. They don't get to hear the music of nature. Uh, they don't get to hear the, the things that uh, uh, kids growing up in the country uh, mm. hear day in and day out. So it, it's going to be uh, interesting to hear what this guy's got to mm -hmm. say. Uh, he's got white hair. That mm. troubles me. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Two things. Number one is, uh, I wish I had hair. <laughs> white, blue, green, any kind of hair. But uh, while he's a, a middle-aged guy, and uh, uh, you, you know, you're middle-aged uh, when, when you go to a wedding and, you're, and the bride's grandmother looks better than the bride, you know, you're middle-aged. He's middle-aged, but he's working with teenagers all the time, and he's got a lot to say about teenagers. Welcome back to Red Letter Christianity. We're here with a new friend of mine, Jim Cummings. And uh, Tony was just busting on you. You couldn't defend yourself. He's talking about your hair and your suit. I think it comes out of his own insecurity here. But uh, how does, how does uh, you know, a middle-aged uh, white guy from the business world connect with kids in Camden? Yeah. Black kids, African-American kids, Hispanic kids, uh, teenagers. That's not who you are. Right. How in the world can you connect with these kids? Well, I, you know, I would answer real quick. The best place is to take them someplace where you can scare the heck out of them, uh, out into the woods or out on a big lake in a boat, and uh, you, you, you get them where they're vulnerable. Uh, but, but, but seriously, I mean, the, the work is far more about developing relationships. But that, that first thing is very important. Well, <laughs> because it, it, when you're on their turf in the inner city, in the ghetto, mm -hmm. uh, they're not threatened at all. Correct. As a matter of fact, you're threatened. <laughs> <laughs> you're frightened. Yeah, you wear that suit down my block yeah. and I'll have to walk by you, you know. Uh, no, I'm <laughs> just kidding. One, ti one time uh, in yeah. Camden, mm -hmm. I, I brought this guy up from the president's office on faith-based initiatives, you know, and he wanted to know what was going on in Camden. And it was, uh, we, we had this long meeting and by the time we left the meeting, it was dark mm -hmm. and uh, night had fallen. And he's, we're walking towards the car and these three gigantic African-American guys with their pants below their waist, you know, looking like the ultimate hoods are walking towards us and I recognize them. And this, this guy from, from, the pre, from the White House said, oh, we're dead meat. We're dead meat. They're gonna kill us. I said, would you feel any better if I told you they were coming from our Bible study? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But tell us about but, that. Well, you know, I mean, seriously, in working with young people uh, and developing relationships, um, I, I have none of those thoughts, none of those fears, being in a place like Camden, you know, thought to be one of the most violent cities in America. Uh, you spend time with kids over a number of years, which is what I do. I, I work with them from their junior high years through their high school years. Uh, I'm in their neighborhoods. I'm in their homes. I'm in their communities. Uh, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an altogether different kind of... We're always scared of what we don't know, you know. And, Absolutely. And, and so whether that's yeah. going out in the mountains or coming in the yeah. city. So as, as you, I, I talk a lot about being, you know, concerned about city people. Right. But I don't live in the city. Mm -hmm. Shane does. Where do, where do you live? Well, I don't either. I live uh, about 15 miles from Camden, yeah. and it's a world apart uh, suburban community that yeah. I commute back and forth. Does this in any way hinder your ability to minister? I, I say no. Um, you know, uh, you, you called me a middle-aged guy. I'm 60 years old. And, uh, you know, my... Yeah. Well, you're, you're going to 120. Well, well, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's... I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah when I was 60, I said, you know, <laughs> I'm middle-aged, and my wife said, how many 120-year-old men do you know? Yeah, who are you kidding? Yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, so there's uh, a real relationship that takes place over a long period of time. And, and taking young people into places that they've never been, doing things that they've never seen before, uh, does in fact make them very porous, very open. If you're going to speak into the life of a young person, you've got to go there first. Uh, that's, that's what we How do. How did you get into this? I mean, I know you left the business world, you're in the city, uh, working with inner city kids. How did you get into all of this? Yeah. What moved you? What spiritually motivated you to do this? Tony, I was active in a small Baptist church in my hometown. Uh, Bruce Main, the president, founder of Urban Promise Ministries, uh, came and 
uh, preached one Sunday, shared about the work that Urban Promise was doing in Camden. And I had a, uh, a lifetime of being a youth group leader, a Sunday school teacher, working with suburban high school students, but a, a real love and passion for the outdoors and nature. A lot of my ministry, my youth work, was always connected to the outdoors, to nature. Mm. I had the idea that I'd start an outdoor club at Urban Promise in the high school. And one Saturday a month, I was gonna come to Urban Promise and take the kids on canoe trips in the Pine Barrens or hiking up in the Delaware Water Gap. Uh, I did that one year. And the very last trip we did was an overnight camping trip to Assateague Island off the coast of Maryland. Beautiful national seashore, wild horses uh, along the bay areas of Assateague. And after this trip, um, Bruce came, we, we'd, we'd get together and have coffee, and Bruce said, so Jim, how, how did the outdoor club go this year? And I, 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 without thinking, I said, you know, Bruce, if I could really do what I'd want to do in life, it would be to figure out a way to do this as full-time ministry. And then he asked me what I thought was the stupidest question. He said, what stops you? I was 53, I owned a business, and I thought the reality was it was pretty clear what stopped me. And you know, I didn't even respond to Bruce, but you know, maybe a couple of weeks went by and that question just nagged at me. And then I thought, well, I'm gonna put this thing to rest and I'll tell my wife, and, and she'll tell me very clearly what stops me. So I, I, I then shared with my wife, I said, you know, Ray Ann, I had this coffee with Bruce, and you know what he asked me? And, and my wife looked at me, and I thought she was going to give me this list of what stopped me. She said, Jim, it's what you've been prepared for. Hmm. Isn't that great? I, you know, I love that saying, uh, Frederick Buechner, <sighs> great writer, he says, when our deepest passions meet the world's deepest pain, we find life, we find our vocation. And Shane, kind of like this is God's work in all this. It couldn't have been two weeks after the conversation with my wife where I'm reading Buechner's book, mm the definition of vocation and come across that. I remember throwing the book in the air, we're in bed at night, and I said, there it is. Sometimes a lot of young people don't go into ministries, don't become missionaries, don't become pastors, don't go into youth work in the inner city or, or in the suburbs. They don't, because they say, I just don't feel called. Mm. And we have so mystified call, you know, and so we've given them the idea because certain people give testimonies like this that I'm sure are valid. I heard this voice in the night, or God spoke to me. Yeah. I heard a message from God. And the kids saying, you know, that never happened to me, so I guess, I guess I'm not meant for ministry because I never heard a voice in the night. Uh, I never heard God speaking to me that way. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you two guys just said is crucial for young people to hear, namely, that a call, you said it well, say it again. Well, when our deepest passions meet the world's deepest pain, yeah. when, when we connect our gifts to uh, the, the brokenness, and, and, it, and you know, I've heard a little bit about what you're doing now with building boats and stuff like that. It seems like that's exactly what you're doing. And uh, uh, so tell, tell us what, what's happening now, some of the things that you see as you're connecting the gifts and things that you have there. Yeah, I mean, one of the coolest things, two years ago, we started a wooden boat building program. We do it in- Wait a minute, yeah. you're building boats? We're building boats. We, we do it in an old abandoned church down in Waterfront South of Camden, one, one of the, the, the most difficult, broken, abandoned areas in the city. And in the basement of this church, we've built a wood shop and we've built rowboats, canoes, kayaks. We're, 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 we're getting these, we're, we're getting our young people to, to not just build the boats, that's part of it but we're getting them on the water to experience the joy of being in a boat. We're you know, teaching them to swim. How many of them know how to swim? Well, no, we, ha we have to teach them to yeah. swim. I, 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 I gotta tell you, yeah. I grew up in the inner city. Yeah. I do not know how to swim. I've never, I never got in the water until I was about 25. Mm -hmm. And I've been scared of the water ever since. Aren't these kids afraid of the water? Absolutely. Yeah, I've almost- Just deep water. They know how to turn a fire hydrant on. <laughs> yeah, know, they, I, know, they, I know that they, for sure. Right. Yeah. But, but, but you know, so that became a critical part of what we were doing was that we were gonna have to teach swimming. So we're teaching swimming, we're teaching sailing, we're teaching paddling. We're making these young people comfortable on the water. And then, I mean, the other piece to it, yeah, I recently I, I got a letter from a woman asking me, why in the world are you building boats with kids in the city? Uh, that's a great question. 
you know, the, the, the first launching, we had built three beautiful sailboats and we launched them on the Cooper River. The reporters from the Enquirer, KYW, everybody was there. The kids were on the water. When they came off the water, the reporters just crowded around them. And I remember KYW asked one of my young men and said, so young man, do you think boat building will be something you'll do after graduation? And he looked at the reporter and he goes, absolutely not. And I thought, oh my gosh, but I could do this with my kids oh. someday. Yes. A fatherless young man yeah. recognizing. That, oh, that's a good line. That, oh. I saw, I remember one of the images that, uh, of, uh, in Waterfront South in Camden, where we, we've got a little community there too. Yes. And I, I, one of the folks in the community was with the kids and they were uh, rowing one of the boats uh, I don't know if it was one of the ones you made or what, but they're rowing it down the river there. Right. And it's going beside one of the giant warships, you know, because Camden South used to be where warships were built. They're going beside, and I see them splashing it with a paddle, you know, this little boat next to this giant warship. And they got off of it, and I said, what were you doing? She says, I was baptizing it, trying to <laughs> drive out the demons of war. <laughs> so, Let me ask you, yeah. I'm an, an old-time uh, Bible preacher, so I, I want to know, is any of this related to winning people to Jesus Christ? I want kids to come to know Christ as their personal Savior, not just go to heaven when they die, yeah. but to be imbued with the presence of the Holy Spirit so that they have the power and the direction to live a life that is glorifying to God. I know that's a lot of religious mm -hmm. talk, a life glorifying God, but I want kids to come to know Jesus and be filled with the Spirit of Christ, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, not yeah. just baptizing yeah. uh, the battleship New Jersey on the Delaware. <laughs> Does any of this relate to that? Well, Tony, absolutely. You know, I mean, those kinds of conversations with young people, as I said earlier, you have to be able to speak into their lives and you have to have invested time with them. Whether it's hours in a boat shop, sanding and working, whether it's hiking the Appalachian Trail 10 hours a day, being totally exhausted, sitting around a fire at night, waking up in the morning, those are the places, those are the times I find when I can really have those conversations with young mm. people. And I can talk about what Jesus has meant to me in my life, and I can share that with them. And they're receptive in those times and those places. You know, one, one of the things that, as I learn in, from Christ, and we look at him, he was, didn't come with the pretension and the, the 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 force of but it became listening sitting down by people at the well and what I love about hearing your story Jim is that um, you've you've come really humbly to offer who you are but also to learn from who people are there and there's a lot of business folks that come into our neighborhood which has uh, lost 200,000 jobs and stuff and they have all these ideas of how they're going to solve the problems in North Philly and really with this sort of messianic hope um, and tell us a little like what you've learned, because I'm sure you've given a lot, but like, uh, you, you know, I'm sure you've learned some things too from living and working there. Um, you know, o over seven years now, and having taken kids to some of the most amazing places, uh, to the Everglades, Pacific Northwest, we've kayaked the ocean off of Maine alongside dolphins. Um, we've been to some incredible places, pristine natural places, and yet, my kids come from what's considered to be the poorest, the most violent city in America, a city that has environmental issues that go back long before they or their families ever lived in Camden. Mm. Um, so to be with young people like that and to start to help them to recognize. Now, this may sound strange to you, Tony, a, a city like Camden that has so much brokenness uh, and so much abandonment to it. There's some amazing natural places in Camden. We're, we're moving forward with the project next year. We're gonna do a year long study of the urban Cooper River, the tidal Cooper mm. that flows through the city, throws, flows through the neighborhoods where a lot of my kids live. There's no access to that river. That river is thought to be polluted. The kids tell me there's dead bodies in it and cars in it and it's the last place they'd ever wanna go. Um, you can get in a canoe and paddle that river and you'll be amazed at some of the natural beauty that exists alongside these skeletons of old factories that have long been abandoned. Um, I, I think that there's probably some great value to be found in discovering that river. So we're going to start out by doing water samples, sediment samples. We're going to go fishing. We're going to get the fish chemically analyzed. We're going to find out 
just how much of a problem that river is. I have a hunch that river's cleaner than it's been in 50 years, mm. and that we should get access to that river to build boat ramps, to put our canoes, our kayaks in. You, you, you do hiking in the wilderness, you build boats and get kids out on the water. Uh, what are your visions for the future? Do you have any new ideas, any new projects that you want to get into? Yeah, well, this, this Cooper River project is, is, is a really big one. Uh, we've written some, uh, some grants that we're hoping to hear from uh, in order to, to fund this, uh, to do it within our high school as an expeditionary learning module. Uh, another... I'm not sure you answered his question. Okay. How have these kids changed you? How has the experience in the inner city changed you? Yeah. Um, well, to my surprise, it wasn't anything that I thought it was going to be when I started out, Shane. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I would come to the city and I would share my wealth of knowledge about uh, the environment. I thought kids would, you know, kind of ask me to maybe quote John Muir and Thoreau and tell them all about the, the wonderful natural uh, areas around Camden. And that's the last thing that's ever happened, uh, quite frankly. Uh, but what has happened is that we've been able to see young people grow now and get turned on to learning, mm. uh, become better students, go to college, go to colleges like Eastern. I've got three graduates that are going to be attending Eastern next year mm. that just right. went through my we gotta, program. You know, I wear this Eastern thing <laughs> yeah. because Eastern is a special school. You get kids off of Potter Street, you get them into Eastern, they get scholarships, you get them out of Camden. Yeah. This school is almost broke because it gives out so many scholarships to poor kids who come from these environments. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you inspire me, and uh, I think you demystified a sense of calling uh, that in some respects you didn't hear a voice from heaven. You're kind of like the disciples who are taking ca care of their nets, cursing the nets, mm -hmm. these darn nets, I'm fixing the nets. And Jesus comes by and says, follow me. Mm -hmm. And I can imagine these guys saying, you know, I hate this. Threw the nets down and follow Jesus. Mm. That's what you did, and I thank you for it. And I thank you for what you're doing for the kids in Camden. Do you want to say goodbye to this guy you know, in a I nice way? The, the, the great thing, too, is you're not alone, right? There's, there's folks, just ordinary business folks, ordinary lawyers that are rediscovering life as they commit their vocations and their gifts to God and connect them with the neighborhoods. And uh, I... I always say when people say nothing good could come out of Nazareth uh, or nothing good could come out of Camden or Philly, it's exactly what they said about Nazareth. That's nothing right. good could come out of there. Shake so. my hand. Indeed. Thanks for being our guest. Welcome back to Red Letter Christianity. Man, we just had a fun conversation with Jim Cummings. Uh, I'm thinking I want to get me one of those boats. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, right down the Delaware River. Yeah. Delaware. Between Philly and Camden. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, the thing that I liked about talking with him is the way he got into this. Uh, that he just said, I think it's time for me to do ministry. A lot of young people who are listening to this show and watching the show uh, are confused about what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. I meet them coming out of high school and I ask them a simple question. Well, you're graduating. What are you going to do? What are you going to be? You're graduating from high school. I get one standard answer. I don't know. Hmm. So if a kid has no goals, no purpose, no direction, what do we usually do? We send them to college. Four years and $200,000 poorer, you're graduating from college. What are you going to do? What are you going to be? <laughs> and what does he say? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> uh, unless he goes to Eastern, of course. Then he says, I'm keeping all of my options open, mm -hmm. which basically means I don't know. I say to young people, why don't you really give a good shot to doing missionary work with a group like Youth with a Mission for a year? Why don't you come and work with a mission year? You can learn about these groups on, on the internet. Uh, and give it a year and really get involved in ministry for a year. Youth with a Mission has tens of thousands of openings for young people. Uh, mission Year, uh, uh, you can go to them, missionyear.org, and, and, and they have many openings for young people. Get involved and, and get a taste of missionary work. Uh, you might as well, because there are no jobs out there anyway. 25% uh, of all college graduates can't find employment. So here's your big opportunity. Give your life to missionary work, at least for a little while, and, and find out what it's like to work with inner city kids. You know, I, I think sometimes people see neighborhoods that are in tough shape like Camden or yeah. w North Philly where we live and they they think well 
it's, it's totally paralyzing. You, you would never want to go there, you know? And yet, I think when we really ask the question as Christians, th those neighborhoods are a perfect place for the kingdom of God to happen. They're poised for resurrection. And so like what he's doing, what Jim's doing in Camden is reimagining that. I, I love that statement that says, some people look at the world as it is and say, why? And other people dream of the world as it could be and say, why not? And that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do, doesn't he? Yeah. He comes and he gives an alternative vision of the future. I have come in the midst of this messy kingdom you're living in to tell you about a new kingdom, the kingdom of God and it is breaking loose in the midst of you. And when you pray, pray for the kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And if frankly, like the, these neighborhoods have not always been like that. You know, Camden w wasn't always abandoned. I mean, it had all kinds of jobs and yeah. it wasn't always an environmental, like absolute catastrophe, but it's because of environmental racism. I mean, chemicals, factories have been dumped and pollution has been dumped on these neighborhoods. So to, to reimagine them and to, yeah. to bring resurrection is-, is That's the big thing. word. Uh, the thing is that Jesus came into the world to renew the world. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. We sometimes get the idea that God's trying to destroy the world or get us out of the world. No, he wants us to be in the world, but not of it. He wants us to be agents of change in the world. He says, I want to start some good work in you. And one day I come back. When I come back, the good work that I've started in you, I'm going to complete on the day of my coming. Mm -hmm. Philippians, the first chapter. So when I see somebody like Jim at work in Urban Promise, that's the name of the larger ministry in which Urban Trekkers, his particular work is set. I say, here are people who are trying to change the city, renew the city, save the city from what it's been, to renew it and bring it back to what God wants it to be. We've got a God, I think you've said this in some of your writings, who specializes in resurrections. Mm -hmm. And I think he's at work trying to resurrect uh, uh, Camden, New Jersey, and thank God for, for uh, Jim and guys like him who are there uh, doing the work of the kingdom, renewing the city, rescuing the city, uh, making the kingdom a little more real to a lot of inner city kids. I think the real question is for folks watching the show, like wh where do you get to join into the adventure? Because when are you going to join the revolution? Uh, this is countercultural stuff. We want you to be a countercultural Christian. That's what people become when they read those red letters in the Bible, the words of Jesus. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And I hope you come back next time because we got more shows to tell you about more fascinating people who are working with young people. And we even got some young people that we want you to meet. God bless and keep you and be faithful. Don't mess around. Be faithful.